All right, I'm alive. <laughs> well, good evening, everyone. Oh, Guy, by the way, uh, folks, folks are saying that it's quiet on the Internet, my voice. So if you can fix that for folks on the Internet, that would be great. So we are live. So uh, if you're wondering about what I mean by live, we're actually live on the Internet for the whole entire world to see. So praise God. Let's get started tonight by opening up in prayer. Hore me sikile kundra batisha la kumbra nekara mahanda dikitini. Kuma la masi tile kunde en debe seko hushika habile kadidini. Dule masu lo bukunda de le kumbre de kende do se le bumbu shile kandale mesa dikinidi. Kumba hasi kotanime shiko la bari de kindula bedungudi. Karamundula bosile kandri hashoku. Je handa bahashi ho shinge dikanemesi to do. Dele masu lo mohudin ni ma karinindu. Be shile kundere bendisa la kumbra na ketanime hukundana. Shalamungudana masa. Thank you, Jesus. We come to you tonight. Father God, we thank you for this time together. We thank you, Father, for your goodness. We thank you, Father, for sending Jesus because you love the entire world. And you demonstrated your love by sending Jesus. And I thank you, Jesus, that you are the one who came. You're the one who died on the cross. You took the sins of the entire world, the consequences and the outcome of sin, upon yourself when you died on the cross. And you rose again on the third day from the dead. You rose again came out of the grave alive. And we thank you, Jesus, that you are alive. You ascended on high, and you're seated at the right-hand side of God the Father. And I thank you that you have sent us, Jesus, the Holy Spirit. And I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you live on the inside of every born-again child of God. And I thank you tonight for your guidance, your leading, your wisdom. I thank you for your understanding. I thank you for your kindness. I thank you for your goodness. I thank you that you never change in who you are. I thank you that you care about every person in this room. You care about every person watching online. You care about every person in the world. And I thank you, Jesus, that you did something to fix what went terribly wrong. You are the one that fixes what goes wrong. And I thank you for this in Jesus' name. You are the corrector. You are the one that brings life, Jesus. And I thank you for this tonight. I thank you that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I thank you that the Bible is the word of God. And I thank you tonight that we have it here. And I thank you, Holy Spirit. I thank you, Father God. I thank you, Jesus, for calling me to Flynn Flon. I thank you for calling me into ministry. Thank you for calling me the pastor of this church. And thank you that you've called me and equipped me and anointed me with your power to do and deliver your word. I thank you tonight for signs, wonders, and miracles. I thank you for the manifestation of your love and grace and power in this place. I thank you, Lord God, that those that are watching online will be set free. And those that are sitting here tonight if they're bound by anything, we'll be set free. I thank you, Jesus, that you came to liberate, to set people free, and, Lord, to bring them abundant life. And I thank you for this in Jesus' name. I thank you, Lord, that you came to fix that which is broken. I thank you that you came to find and save that which was lost. And I thank you that, Lord, you came to liberate those that are bound. I thank you tonight that you are the healer, the savior, the deliverer, and that there is no other name under heaven whereby anybody can be saved except the name Jesus. And I thank you because of what you did for us, Jesus. It is profoundly effective. It is miraculous. It is phenomenal. It is awesome. It is fantastic. And I thank you for this in Jesus' mighty name tonight. And I thank you, Lord, that you said, Jesus, if you continue in my word, then you're my learners indeed. And you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And we thank you, Lord God, that we're not following the world's truth. 
We want to follow your truth. And it's your truth that has set me free from many things over the past over 30 years since I've been following you. And I thank you, Lord, that you continue. Your word continues. It never fails to those that believe it. And I thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good to have you here tonight. And uh, good to have you guys here tonight. Uh, don't be afraid. I don't bite. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, I know some people think I'm scared. My, wa- my daughter one time when I was uh, uh, at an amusement park, and, you know, you go on those roller coasters and they take pictures of you and then they put it up on the screen. So then after our roller coaster ride, I'm actually taking a picture of our picture. And uh, my da- daughter's like, Dad, and my son's like, Dad, I don't think you're supposed to do that. And I said, they take my picture, I take my picture. I can take it if I want. It's my picture. And, uh, and the lady, the worker comes up from behind the counter, Sir, and I just put my hand up one minute as I continue to take pictures. And, uh, and my, mo- my daughter after said, Dad, you're like the mafia. <laughs> I said, well, take my picture. I'll take a picture of my picture. Uh, so anyways, uh, but I'm not that scary. Trust me. If you have your Bibles tonight, we're going to get into the Word of God. And we're going to talk about, um, we talk, we, t- this night's been healing night. And what I've been sharing about is hindrances to healing. But tonight I want to I want to flip to the hinderer of healing. Tonight I want to fo- I want to help you guys understand there's a hinderer to healing just like it's the same one that hinders people's salvation or hinders people's deliverance or people there's a hinderer. But the good news there's a good news about that tonight that Jesus came to destroy the works of the hinderer. And that's the good news, because he's already done it. He's not going to be doing it. He's already done it. And those that believe in Jesus and exercise the authority that they have in Christ Jesus, because he's a winner. Jesus is the winner. He's on top of everything else. The Bible says that he is seated above the principalities and powers. He's seated above every authority. He's seated over every power. He is seated over everything. And people say, well, if he's seated over everything, why is there bad things happening in this world? Because... He's coming back in Revelations to finalize the job. Revelations, it's called the second coming of Christ. It's coming. And right right now, what we're seeing in the world, there's a a ton of scriptures. Remember, this Bible was written over a period of 4,000 years ago. And uh, and so because this book has been written over 4,000 years and and over a span of about 2,000 years, between the first pages to the last pages. The writers in between, over 60 writers uh, that wrote the Bible. And, uh, and yet there's a theme from the beginning to the end. And why is that? Because even though there's that many different people that wrote the Bible, the author is the Holy Spirit. The author is God. And, uh, and so we have the Bible, and it's the most accurately written historical document to doubt that the Bible is not real, then we would have to throw out every other, reli- uh, not religious, religious and archaeological, what I'm getting at is every other archaeological book that's ever been found in the history of mankind would have to be thrown out. This is the most accurate, archaeologically, most accurate, most complete document on planet Earth. And to come and say that the Bible is not true is an ignorant person who doesn't know archaeology, doesn't know the facts, doesn't know. Did you know that this book actually talked about scientific things before science figured it out? This Bible is a most accurate book on planet Earth. It's because the author of the book is God. And when people get a hold of the Bible and what's written inside the Bible and get a hold of it on the inside of themselves, dynamic things start happening. When I was 13 years old, I was an atheist. I I, I called myself an atheist. I said I didn't believe in any God. And, uh, And then I was wanting to commit suicide. 
And, uh, and um, before I committed uh, suicide, actually, I was going to try to commit suicide at home and then uh, with a knife. And then my mom knocked at the door and I yelled at her, what do you want? And she said, I'm just checking to see if you're alive. So then I thought, well, I'm going to figure out how I'm going to commit suicide. And I'm going to borrow my neighbor's shock and tell him I'm going to go hunting. I mean, these are the thoughts that was going through my head. And I'm going to go in the bush and blow my head off. And these were the thoughts that I was going through my head. And, uh, and before, and I actually marked it down on the calendar when I was going to do it. I put it in a calendar. I marked it down. I said, this is the day. And a week before that day, uh, a friend of mine came over and told me about Jesus. And when I received Jesus into my heart, my world changed. And my world has changed ever since then. Changed for the better. Has there been challenges? Have I had difficulties and problems? Yes. But I've overcome every one of them with the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And, I, and what I'm teaching here tonight is how you can be victorious. How you can overcome. So are you ready to get in the Word tonight? Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 to 18, uh, tells us some pretty dynamic things. So tonight we want to talk about the hinderer of, uh, to healing. The hinderer to healing. So Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 to 18. Now, I, I've been sharing why, hindrances to healing, and, and that was focusing on us as, as believers in receiving healing. And, uh, but let's talk about the one who brings the sickness and hinders people from receiving healing when they're not walking in faith and not walking in love or not walking in hope. Actually, you need all three, faith, hope, and love. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 says, Now these three things remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. And why is love so important? Faith will not work when it's not operating in love. So if you have unforgiveness towards somebody... And you could be, you could believe the Bible. You can believe, and you can be saying all the right things, and be, and you can be hearing all the right things, and all of a sudden, uh, uh, it's still not working. Your prayers aren't going anywhere. Nothing's happening. Why? Because faith must be in operation for a prayer to work. The uh, prayers don't make the difference. It's the prayer of faith that makes the difference. And there's a lot of people that pray, and nothing happens. It's like rubbing two nickels together and hoping you're going to make a million dollars out of it. Never going to happen. <laughs> All right. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 to 18. It says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Verse 11 says, Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil or the attacks of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the day of evil or the evil day. And having done all to stand, verse 14 says, stand therefore. Having done all to stand, stand therefore. Having girded your waist, with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith. The shield of faith. The shield of faith. Why take up the shield of faith? He says, above all. He says, above all in verse 16. Taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Now, the problem is, is you got Christians who are dragging their faith shield. So pretend, pretend this piece of paper is a shield. There's a lot of Christians dragging it. They're not holding it up. They're dragging it. Okay? They got, they got the faith, but they're dragging their faith. Right? And they're getting peppered by the darts of the devil. And then they're wondering why everything's falling apart. Why everything's, well, the shield of faith is missing. You got yourself wide open for all the peppery darts of, uh, darts of the devil being thrown at you. So then it goes on and says um, in verse 17, And take the helmet of salvation, which is knowing salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, which is the Word of God, the sword, uh, which is the Word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. You notice in the Spirit. 
Whenever you see the phraseology in the Spirit, it actually means to be praying in, the, in other tongues. The Bible talks about it. That uh, in, in Mark chapter 16, he says, These signs will follow them that believe. In my name they will cast out devils, and they will speak in other tongues. It's in the Bible. Praise God. So we're seeing this sort of thing in the Bible. So we see in Ephesians chapter 6 that it says there in verse 11, I'll just go back over it again, again it says uh, that um, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Okay, so put on the whole armor of God. It's not actually going and, and putting on a physical suit. It's putting on the knowing, the new man. Because there's another scripture that says put on the new man. In other words, walk out. If you're a born again child of God, walk out your new birth life in the faith. How did you get saved? By faith in what Jesus did. How did you get saved? By receiving Jesus, by believing and receiving Jesus in your heart, you became born again. Jesus said you can't see the kingdom of God unless you're born again. So, so we see these things in the, in the scripture, and when we un- grab hold of them, praise God, things start happening and start changing for good. Bad things happen. Why do bad things happen? Because we live in a sinful, fallen world. When did this fallen, sinful world happen? When Adam and Eve took the fruit that God told them not to take. Sin entered the world. God said, if you take the fruit, you shall surely cause death. Well, when they took that fruit, death caused was caused. And death started happening and, uh, and being uh, affecting everything on this planet. Not only in this planet, in this universe. Because apparently stars die. Right? Stars die. And anyways. Uh, but when you read the Hebrew, so Old Testament was written in Hebrew, the New Testament was written in Greek. When you read the Hebrew language of uh, uh, you, shall, you shall surely die is the way it's written in English. But when you look at the Hebrew, it actually says you shall surely cause death which is more accurate because when they did take that fruit, it caused death to everything on this earth. And, we've, and, and, G, and not only that, God said, uh, because you've done that, you're going to be working by the sweat of your brow. Because you've done that, the woman's going to give uh, birth in pain because of that. And, uh, and so those are the things that were mentioned in Genesis chapter 3 at the very beginning of the Bible. But let's keep going on here. So we see in Ephesians chapter 6 that uh, we stand, we are to stand against the wiles of the devil. And then 12 says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. So whenever I'm dealing with, uh, when I'm dealing with difficult situations, I'll give you an example of this. Uh, we were visiting a couple in Marathon. Uh, they, they were... Um, well, the daughter was, the, the girl, the lady, she was a daughter of a pastor. And uh, she hooked up with this guy and, and, uh, and, you know, they did things they shouldn't have done. And, and uh, they ended up getting pre- she ended up getting pregnant and then later on getting married. But we ended up getting to know them, Valerie and I. And, uh, and we became friends. And we started, uh, we, you know, we got to, we got to hang out and, and uh, they were Christians. But every time we went there, there would be fights. I mean, fights, intense fights. And when Valerie and I would visit, after we leave there, Valerie and I would start fighting. And we'd start fighting. And I'm like, wait a minute, we don't do this normally. But when we go visit these guys in Marathon, uh, Ontario, we, after visiting them, we're fighting. We're arguing, we're fighting. And uh, so then I said, then lightning fast mind of mine says, there's a demonic spirit in operation in their house. That when we go, we're, we're, we're getting affected and peppered with the fiery darts of the enemy. So anyways, we, so Valerie and I decided that as we were invited again to come down and we went driving down to Marathon, we pray, and it's a, it was a three hour drive uh, from Thunder Bay to Marathon. And, uh, and so we began to drive, and, and we would be praying, and we would begin to bind those demon spirits in that household. And, uh, and so we finally get there. They didn't fight once. 
And then when we, we were actually playing cards at the table, and, uh, and, and all of a sudden, the, the wife, she breaks down and starts crying and uncontrollably. And, uh, and the husband's like, what's going on here? And I said, it's just the Holy Spirit taking over and just doing some good stuff right now. <laughs> and why was that? Because we bound the spirits and we began to declare that we were going to have a good weekend with them. We began to speak that we were, we were beginning to declare things. We were speaking by faith. We were walking by faith. And, uh, and anyways, uh, she, ended up, she ended up turning around and right there, they never fought. Okay, so they never fought when we were there. She breaks down crying, and she starts saying, would you please forgive me to her husband? Then her husband starts crying, and he says, would you please forgive me? And then they forgive, they're they forgiving one another, and Valerie and I are looking at each other, and we're just smiling. <laughs> this is great. <laughs> uh, uh, but the thing that we need to understand is we wrestle not, the Bible says, against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, and spiritual wickedness, or uh, rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual uh, uh, hosts and wickedness in the heavenly places. Now, you have to understand something. I'm going to share some other scriptures with you. We're not, as Christians, we're not, uh, we're not fighting to try to get the victory over demons. We've already got the victory. We've already got the victory. We're not going to get the victory. Jesus has already secured the victory. And when I gave my life to Jesus and he came inside of me and lives and he lives on the inside of me, I'm living with the victorious one. And because I'm living with the victorious one and my, by faith, how do, I live, how do I live in the victorious one? By faith I'm living by victorious. And therefore, because I'm living victorious, with the, I'm, uh, because he's victorious, I'm living with the victorious one, which makes me victorious. But there's a lot of Christians that turn around and don't understand that because the victorious one lives on the inside of me, uh, or inside of them, they don't realize that they have the victory. The Bible says, thanks be unto God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So the moment, I, I, you know what, I'm not trying to, I've given up trying to fight for things. I just, I just rest by faith in Jesus who already gave me the victory, and then I start seeing victory. And actually, I just, I, really what it boils down to is uh, picking up the shield of faith. Okay, let's keep going on here. V Ephesians chapter 6. So we wrestle, uh, we're wrestling against not flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places, and, and therefore take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand, stand therefore. Now you notice that in verse 13 it says, uh, able to withstand in the evil day. We're living in evil days. You know, uh, four, 30 years ago, what was considered wrong today is considered right. And the Bible said that in the last days they will be saying, what is good is evil, and what is evil is good. So how do we know we're living in the last days? Because the Bible says in the last days these things will happen. We're seeing them happen today. Now there's a lot of other signs that the Bible talks about that we're coming to the end of the days of this world. And, uh, and those signs are happening. Uh, but we're not going to get into that tonight. That's not what we're talking about. First Peter, or before we go to First Peter, the other one is... In this verse, again, what we're wrestling against, verse 16, above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. See, when people get, when Christians get sick, sickness does not come from God. Sickness was never from God. God doesn't want anybody sick. God wants everybody healthy. Okay? Just as he wants everybody saved, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting 
life. And the Bible also goes on, if you read it in another verse of Scripture, it says that God does not want that anyone should perish, but that all should come to repentance, which means change your, your way of thinking in the right direction. So when we look at uh, um, what Jesus did for us, Jesus is the one that died on the cross. He rose again for us to have victory. And, it's, and the Bible also says that Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. So faith, he is faith. He's the author of faith. And he's the finisher of faith. When I received Je- when I heard about Jesus, faith came, the faith of God came to my heart to receive Jesus. And then I received Jesus in my heart, and, it, and my world changed. I didn't want to kill myself anymore. Everything changed for me. I cha- my life changed. And, uh, and what happened was, I mean, everything changed. The, the colors changed. The blue sky was bluer. The green grass was greener. Everything seemed to be clearer, sharper, brighter. And I'm like, Wow. I don't know why anybody wouldn't want this. <laughs> and I'm, everything, it was like I was living in a box. But when I asked Jesus in my heart, it's like those walls of those boxes fell down. It was like I had, before, it was like I had chains on me. I felt like I was weighed down. But when I gave my life to Jesus, the chains popped off. And I felt so light. It's, re- it's a awesome, awesome. I, you listen, getting drunk will never give you this. Getting high will never give you this with drugs. Uh, Jesus is my high. It's better to get drunk in the Holy Ghost because there's no after effects. One time we were, uh, the Bible says that in Acts chapter 2 the, that the disciples, they were, Jesus said, wait here till you receive power from on high. For the Holy Spirit will come upon you and be witnesses for me in Jerusalem and Judea and to the uttermost parts of the earth. And so the disciples, there's 120 uh, 20 of them that waited in the upper room. And on the day of Pentecost, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they all began to speak in other tongues. And then, uh, and then the people around in the city were hearing this and they came around to check it out. And they said, wow, these people are drunk. And, uh, and, and, the, and, the, and Peter gets up uh, and says, uh, we're not drunk as you think, but this is that which was spoken of in the Old Testament by the prophet Joel. And he talked about being uh, filled with the Holy Spirit, that we would have, uh, and he just began to preach on a message of what Joel said, that we would uh, uh, be changed by the power of the Holy Spirit, we'd be filled with the Holy Spirit, we'd be filled with the power of God. And so everybody thought we were drunk. So one day we were uh, at church in, at a Koken. That's where I was pastoring before. And uh, we had uh, uh, just an awesome time with God. And uh, Mrs. Trudeau, I was driving Mrs. Trudeau home. And, uh, and we, were la- we, were just, we were laughing. We were just bubbly and giggly and we were laughing. We were just laughing, just having a good time and, uh, with God. And um, anyways, we, we were, as I was driving her home, there was a police stop check place point, you know, for drunk drivers, checking for drunk drivers. And, uh, and <laughs> so, we, so I thought, how funny this was. I mean, both me and Mrs. Trudor are just laughing away. And uh, we drive up, and, and uh, the, the officer looks in, says, have you had anything to drink? And we just burst out laughing. We just burst out laughing. We said, we sure have. <laughs> And and the and the cop was a Christian, and he and he knew us, and he looked at us. He says, "Oh, you two, go on, get out of here." He said. <laughs> but anyhow, God is good God, and then when we see that the the Bible says, "Pick up the shield of faith," or uh, above all, it says, "Above all, take up taking the shield of faith." In verse sixteen, it says, "With." with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Now, the good news is having the shield of faith up, you're going to stop every dart of the devil. It's going to stop it. It quenches it, stops it from being, any, uh, being effective in harming you. But why are Christians being harmed? Because they drop their shield of faith and they're dragging it. All right? They're dragging their shield of faith and they're getting peppered. Oh, yeah, thank you for enthusiasm tonight. 
So for <laughs> 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5 to 9, another portion of Scripture talking about the enemy. It says, uh, but starting at verse 5, it says this. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5, it says, Likewise, you younger people, submit yourself to your pastors. Okay? The word translated is elders, but if you look at the Greek word, it actually means pastor. It doesn't mean old person. It means pastor. And so in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5 says, Likewise, you younger people, submit yourself to your pastors. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. Why be clothed with humility? For God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. What's, what's grace? Well, the, uh, Paul writes in, in um, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, 11, 12, 13. Just read all of 1 Corinthians or 2 Corinthians and you'll find it there. But it says that uh, Paul was being attacked by the devil. Okay, let's turn there so you can see it. This is in 2 Peter. Or 2, not Peter, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And uh, in verse 7, and I'm going to read this from the King James Version because I, I find that it's the most accurate to the original language of the Greek. Uh, it writes it this way, And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations. So Paul was getting, uh, God was revealing things to Paul abundantly. He was getting the down download from God. And he was getting a lot of download from God. And, and what it was doing was causing him to be exalted. Now, don't get confused here. A lot of, a lot of translations talks about pride or it insinuates it's about pride here, but it's not. It cannot be pride. Okay? God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble, it says in uh, Peter. And so, and James actually says the same thing. God, God uh, resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And, uh, but if you keep reading in Peter, he says, Therefore, humble yourself. This is in verse 6, chapter 5, verse 6 in, in Peter, 1 Peter. He says, Therefore, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you. That he may exalt you in due time. It's not about pride, because God resists the proud. So why would God elevate somebody to be proud? So it's not talking about pride. Because God resists the proud. And God's not going to elevate you to pride so he can resist you. <laughs> it doesn't make sense. All right. So for, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, Paul says here, uh, Unless I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan. To buffet me. Now, Satan can only be in one place at one time, as, along with all his demons and devils. They can only be, just like you can only be in one place at one time, devils and demons can only be in one place at one time. They are not the Holy Spirit of God who's everywhere. Okay, there's a big difference. Demonic spirit. So, so this was a messenger of Satan, the Bible says. And what was the messenger of Satan doing? He was buffet, to buffet me. So Satan sent this demon to buffet Paul, who was preaching the gospel. And, he was, and the buffet there means to punch, literally to, 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 to really slug people, to punch them. That's what buffet means. And it says, uh, there was a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. So what was the, what was the demonic spirit, what was the goal of the demonic spirit? It was to stop him from getting abundant revelation. Jesus said in Mark chapter 4, he said the sower sows the word of God on the different grounds. The grounds that is being referred to in Mark chapter 4 is people's hearts. And, and he mentions four different grounds in Mark chapter 4. And he says the first ground is where the word of God was sown into a person's heart. They received that word gladly, but Satan came along and stole that word. And how does he steal the word from people? By causing them to doubt it. 
And when you doubt God's word, he's able to steal it. He's able to steal that word. And, uh, and so, so that's what Satan does. Is he, the Bible, Jesus said, the first ground is Satan comes immediately to take that word away from people. What is the objective of every devil, demon, and Satan himself is to stop the word of God from taking root in a person's heart. So he'll do all kinds of weird things to cause people to think that he's, I mean, exorcist, for example. Exorcist was, was Satan trying to glorify what he thinks he can do. And making a Catholic priest run around uh, with his shorts down, basically. And unable to do anything. And, uh, and get beat up by devils and demons. But since I, I'm going to tell you something. Since I got a hold of God's word, I've been beating them up. I don't tolerate them. I don't Because I know my authority in Jesus. Are you here? As believers, we ought to know our authority. Because the Bible says that Jesus is seated in the heavenlies with the Father above all these principalities and powers. Then it goes on and says, if you keep reading down from uh, Ephesians chapter 1 into chapter 2, it says that we have been seated with him in the heavenlies. So when I gave my life to Jesus, I am actually seated with Jesus in the heavenlies above the principalities and powers. I'm not fighting devils and demons from a losing position to try to get winning position. I'm fighting from a winning position and exercising authority of that winning over that demon. All right. Thank you for your enthusiasm. Now, let's keep reading. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 8. So, so we see here that the, verse 7 talks about, uh, lest I should be exalted above, uh, uh, exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations of what he was he getting from God's word, uh, from God. Uh, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Then verse 8, he says, for this thing I, I besought, or I went to the Lord three times, that it would depart from me. So he went to God, and he's like, God, make this stop. Now, what was God's response to his prayer? In verse 9, he says, and this is what God said, my grace is sufficient for you. That's very powerful, by the way. So what is grace? Well, he goes on and says, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, Paul then, he, Paul responds to this by saying, Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my weaknesses or in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. So when you come to the end of yourself, that's the great place to be. Because now, God's grace can work. Are you here? So when you think that all, all is lost, uh-uh. No way. You know, I, I, thought my, I thought family members were lost, but you know what? My family members have given their life to Jesus, every one of them. My sister, she thought I was a, a so I have two older sisters, and, um, and my second oldest sister, closer to me, and myself, we got saved around the same time. So when I was thinking of committing suicide, the friend came and told me about Jesus. I gave my life to Jesus. And, and that Sunday, I went to church. And when the pastor said, come up, anybody wants to receive Jesus in life, I went up to make it a public statement that I've received. I want Jesus in my life. And I did that. My sister, it wasn't too long that she gave her life to Jesus, my second oldest sister. My oldest sister, she's like, you guys are a bunch of freaks. You guys are nut jobs. You guys are weirdos. You know, like she was like, you went too far because we went to church all the time. I still go to church all the time. Uh, it never changed. <laughs> I still, I'm still going to church. But, uh, but you know, it, there was a dynamic change in my life because I came into contact with a God who's in love with me, who cares about me, who it loves everybody. 
cares about everybody. But, I mean, I came in contact. I, I'm not, this is not about a religion. I'm not here to promote religion. I hate religion. I'm here to promote a relationship. And that relationship is in Jesus. It's in God. Jesus actually took the wall that separated us from God, which was sin. Sin separated us from God. Jesus died on the cross and rose again to remove that sin from our lives. God is not mad at the world anymore. God is not mad at the world. He has, the Bible says that, that uh, he has given us a ministry of reconciliation, which is what? That God was personally in Christ Jesus reconciling the world to himself, forgiving the world its sins and not holding the sins against them anymore, but restoring the world to favor with himself. And then giving us a ministry of reconciliation, which is to go out and tell people that God's not mad at you anymore. Well, why are all these bad things happening? It's because there's an enemy who wants you to be defeated. The Bible says in John 10, 10 that the thief, which is the devil, the thief comes to steal, kill, destroy. That's, his, that's his, the, the motive operandum of the devil, is to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus then said, but I've come to bring life. And that more abundantly. My God is not a killer. Let me say that again. My God is not a killer. He gets blamed for a lot of killings. He's not behind any one of them. Because he's a good, good God. He's a good, good God. I remember one time there was a, a, a actually it was here. We prayed. Uh, Jim Christian, um, there was a hurricane that was going to hit this area. And there was a, Christians that said, would you pray with us and agree with us? Jim sent that message to us, and we prayed together. And when we prayed, that storm actually shifted away from that community. After we prayed. Okay. Okay, that went over like a lead balloon. Anyways. <laughs> But God said, my grace is sufficient. The word sufficient there in the Greek means more than enough. In other words, no matter what the devil tries to throw at me, the grace of God in my life is greater than whatever the devil can throw at my life. Yeah, he's tried to kill me. Yeah, he's tried to kill me. Yeah, he's tried to kill my kids. He's tried to steal from me. But we took a firm stand. This is my son st sitting on the camera, behind the camera. He should be dead. I told you the story, uh, Matt, but he should be dead. Because the doctor, when my wife was pregnant with him, he should have been, he should have been aborted. The doctor said that he, there's a tubal pregnancy. She, my wife was bleeding and having pains. And, and uh, when the doctor said, we'll have to abort him, I said no. And the doctor trying to explain it to me, you don't understand, Mr. Mantilla. And I said, and, and she's trying to explain that if, the, if we don't abort the baby, not only will the baby die, but your wife will die also. Because as it grows in that tube, it's going gonna, it's gonna to cause a rupture and kill your wife as well. And, and so she was trying to explain this to me, and I said no. And she's like, you don't understand, Mr. Mantilla. And I looked at the doctor, and I said, no, you don't understand. I don't operate according to this world's rules. I operate according to God's rules. And my God says that he's came to bring life and that more abundantly. And my wife will live and my son will live. And nobody's, and I, I actually said son before I knew he was my son. I actually did. And, and they turned around and the doctor looked at me so weird. And, and, and we left the doctor's office, went to the pa senior pastor's uh, office of the church that I was attending, and I said, the Bible says, if anyone among you sick, let them call for the elders, and anointing the sick with oil, and the prayer of faith shall save the sick. And so he anointed my wife with oil, we prayed, we believed, that it, done deal. And, and that moment, the bleeding stopped, the pain stopped, the peace came, and we went the next day, the doctor scheduled us the next day for an ultrasound, and the ultrasound, the, the guy's doing this thing, and he's like, I don't know what's going on with whatever the doctor but everything's good down there go have great pregnancy and here's my son here's my son now praise God my daughter who's sitting in the back seat there we already had these things figured out we just said devil you're not even going to come close to messing around with this stuff 
And my wife had a perfect pregnancy. And I thought, well, what else can we have supernatural with our daughter? And so I said, I said, you know, we're, my son was born 15 minutes to midnight. It was a whole day ordeal. And I just said to my, I said after my son was born, I said, this is crazy. Because she was in labor. And I said, when I'm in labor, I'm at work. And so I was doing construction work. And I said, I, and I'm laboring from 8 o'clock in the morning till 5.30 at night. And I said, I said to uh, my wife, I said, with J- Janelle, she, uh, when, you're, when you're giving birth to her, it's going to be during a working day. Not at night like Joshua. Not like, you know, whenever. And, and when, we got to, when, when it happened... Uh, it was around 9 o'clock in the morning. She started. Actually, started a little bit before then. And uh, we get to the hospital. And, uh, and I said to doctors, uh, she's going to be born at 3 o'clock. And the nurses and the doctors all looked at me and said, well, these things, they're natural. We can't say these. And I would say to the nurses, I said, are you going to be here at 3 o'clock? And she's like, why? That's when the baby's coming. And the doctor come in. I said, are you going to be here at 3 o'clock? He says, why? Because the baby's coming at 3 o'clock. And they kept saying, looking at me like, well, these things are natural. You can't just say it's going to be at 3. No, I said it's going to be 3 o'clock. She was ready to come out at 3 o'clock. And the doctors actually was holding her from coming out. So she got born at 16 minutes after 3. But she was ready. I mean, uh, Joshua, he's taking his time coming out. But Janelle, she was ready to just jump, you know, bungee jump off the bridge kind of thing, you know. And the personality actually is reflected in both of them that way. <laughs> Josh has to process things. Janelle's like, let's just do it. <laughs> but he said to Paul, when Paul prayed three times, my grace is sufficient for you, which is the strength of God, it is, it is the strength of God. It's the power of Christ. It's the power of Christ. You notice in that uh, verse 9, uh, when he says, Most gladly, therefore, I rather glory in my infirmities or my weaknesses, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. He notice he says that the power of Christ. Christ is not the name of Jesus. It's what happened to Jesus. Christ actually means anointing. Jesus was anointed. It says that in Luke chapter 4 that the Spirit, Jesus said, The Spirit of the Lord is come upon me, for he has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor people. Right? What else did he do? To open the blind eyes, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to heal the brokenhearted, to set free those that are bound. I mean, he, 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 he was anointed. And after he was anointed, we see signs, wonders, and miracles following the life of Jesus because uh, before he was anointed, he was anointed when he was about 30 years old. Before that, we don't hear any miracles. We don't hear any miraculous things taking place until after he's anointed. Why? It's because he was anointed by the Holy Spirit. Now, why did Jesus say it's important for me to leave so that I can send you the Holy Spirit? So what G- after Jesus died on the cross and rose again, he sent us the Holy Spirit which is the anointer. And the Bible says in Romans chapter 8, the same Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit that rose Jesus from the dead now lives inside of us and makes alive our mortal bodies. Oh, huh. Listen, I worked all day. I was at the, now some people say I don't do anything at the bank, but I worked all day, you know, from 8 o'clock in the morning till tonight, it was after 6, around 6.30, I left the bank. And so I left 6.30, and I went and picked up my wife, dropped, and gave her the trucks, and then came straight here. But I feel wide awake. Why? Because it's the power of the Holy Spirit inside of me that makes my life, my mortal body, come alive. Now, once I'm done, I'm ready to go to sleep. (laughs) I'm ready to go to sleep. But, you know, here we see that the power of Christ, the grace is sufficient for me, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather glory in my infirmities or my weaknesses that the power of Christ may rest upon me. It's the power of the anointer. 
I want the, you, you trying to do this in your own strength? Listen, I, 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 okay, let me put it this way. Pastoring is the hardest job on earth. Some people are like, really? You don't get paid very good? Well, at least I haven't. A lot of pastors are experiencing that. They don't get paid very good. And that's why I work at another job. Would I work full-time pastoring? I don't know. I've been working part-time pastoring for 30 years, so I (laughs) kind of got used to this. (laughs) But the thing is this, that I wanted to quit. I probably, if you calculate it, if, if God could show me the number of how many times I thought about quitting, pastoring, it was probably close to between two to 10,000 times in 30 years. There's days I, come to, I came to church and I'm like, oh, I don't want to be here. <laughs> Especially when you got the, a few of the folks that were sitting there looking at you like this. And they're supposed to be your biggest supporters. I said to one person that always looked like that when she came to church, I said, are you born again? And she looked at me and she said, I've been born again. And that's how she talked. I have been born again for over 40 years. And she kind of had that look on her face. And then I looked at her and I said, well, why don't you tell your face that you're born again? (laughs) She got offended over that, of course. And then, she, and then she invited me for lunch. <laughs> and she at lunch, she'd say, you know I'm born again. I said, why are you so grumpy about it? You're a miserable cuss sometimes. I told her that straight to her face. I said, You're a miserable cuss. You know, Jesus came to bring you life and that more abundantly, and it doesn't look like you have life, and it doesn't look like you got it more abundantly. You're still wearing your husband's underwear. That died 15 years ago. I mean, what's wrong with this picture? <laughs> anyway. <laughs> oh, she was a blessing, though. She was. She was a blessing. I tell you. <laughs> she was. She's, I could talk freely about her because she's gone on to be with Jesus. And uh, I sure hope that she's got a smile on her face in heaven at least. You know, or I hope she's not walking around in heaven going. Yeah, now she, yeah. <laughs> now she's got clean underwear, right? <laughs> oh, boy. Okay. <laughs> Aren't you glad he gives us robes? And, hey, that's biblical. He gives us robes. Uh, clothing that is white. Garments that are white, whiter than snow. Aren't you glad there's a good cleaning company in heaven? Anyway, some of you are like, there's a cleaning company in heaven? Really? What's it called? It's called Jesus Dry Cleaning. Anyways. <laughs> okay, stop me now. I got to stop right <laughs> <laughs> yeah, stretch your hands towards me right now. <laughs> Luke chapter 13. Let's just keep going on. Oh, no, I said 1 Peter, didn't I? Okay, so 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 5 to 9 again. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your pastors. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility, for God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Aren't you glad for that? The Bible says that he cares for you. Stop carrying your care. Give it to God. Why does it look like I'm living a stress-free life? Because I gave all my cares to God. He's got way bigger shoulders than I do. And capabilities. 
more than me. He's got more strength, more power, more wisdom, more understanding. Why am I keeping it? And why am I trying to figure it out? So I learned a long time ago that, you know, when my wife gave me problems, <laughs> no, no, uh, because we've had, listen, we've had marital problems, but one of the things that I learned is surrendering, humbling myself first to God. And then God starts speaking to me about my marriage. And then he starts telling me, well, you've been doing this. You've had this attitude. You need to bring that before me. And I did. I brought before God. I repented, which means change your way of thinking, which I did. And how do I change my way of thinking? By finding out what God's word says. Stop thinking the way I'm thinking. And I started agreeing with what the Bible was saying. And when that happened, it saved my marriage. It saved my marriage. Now, I can tell you, it's the same thing. When Joshua, when they wanted to abort Joshua, me submitting my, my thoughts to what God says about how he's a life giver. How if there's anyone among you sick, let them call for the elders. I submitted myself to what the Bible says and did what the Bible said to see positive results. It is God and his word that saved my son, saved my marriage, saved my finances. My wife had cancer. All of you know this. Not all of you, but my wife had cancer. And when she was diagnosed, they did a biopsy of the spot, and the doctor called us in right away. And while we were in the doctor's office, this is in Thunder Bay, Ontario, the doctor said it's cancer. And, it's, and because it's been here, you told us it was there for a number of years or a couple of years, it's probably spread throughout your whole body. And my wife, my, my wife, I mean, my wife and I were hearing this at the same time from the doctor. And I looked at the doctor and I said, no. I disagree with the doctors a lot. I really do. Because I'm agreeing with Dr. Jesus. And so my, the doctor said, the doctor started to, we need to do blood work, we need to do chemo, uh, we get, uh, not chemo, but um, radi we need to do a CAT scan or what do you call that, a big, all, they scan the whole body. I, CAT scan, yeah. Uh, no, I think it was a CAT scan, I don't know. Whatever, they scan the whole body. And, uh, but... After the doctor said that, the first time, I said no. We stepped out of the doctor's office. We're in the hallway. And I just took my wife by the hand. And I said, cancer is not in this body. I command it gone in the name of Jesus. Drove home from Thunder Bay back to Atacokan. And, uh, and then I took the oil out. And I, I'm, I'm a pastor. I'm an elder. And I anointed my wife with oil. Actually, I, I put... Uh, I put oil in my hand, and I told her, put your feet in my hand. And as I was praying for her, the, the oil started popping like popcorn. Never seen that before. You know? And I just, it started popping like pop. And my wife, and then my wife said, I'm healed. Now, we went and got blood work. And the blood work came back as no cancer. Then we went for the body, the, the body CAT scan, the full body CAT scan. We're sitting in the cancer clinic in Thunder Bay, and we're reading the Bible right there, and there's people in the room, and all of a sudden people start looking at us. And, what are you doing? What are you reading there? We said, oh, it's the Bible. Why are you reading the Bible? Oh, because we like hearing good news. That's what we said. We like hearing good news. The Bible's got lots of good news. And so I started reading the good news. And, and they said, why are you here? Well, they want to do a body, a CAT scan of her body. Oh, then you must, it must be serious. One person, it must be. And I said, no, no, she doesn't have cancer. That's the way we talk. She doesn't have cancer. Now, a lot of people look at that and say, they're in denial. No, we were in faith. 
we were in faith. And we just said, no, she's, she's got no cancer. So she went in. They did the whole CAT scan, tried to find where the cancer had spread, because that's what the doctor said it's probably spread, and um, came back as negative. No tumors, nothing to be found. The spot where they did the biopsy, the spot itself was actually shrinking and, and disappearing. And the doctor, and, and my wife says, because they scheduled her for an operation to have the spot removed and take out more. And, uh, and my wife said, uh, do you really need to do that? It's shrinking. And the, and, the, and the receptionist to the surgeon's office said, what do you mean it's shrinking? That was the response. What do you mean it's shrinking? It's, it's getting smaller. Cancer doesn't get smaller, she said. <laughs> I'm listening. To my wife, I've heard listening. I said, well, this is. And she turned around and she says, well, we still want to do the operation. So my, I said to my wife, I said, well, go for the operation and, 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 take, and do it. And she uh, went through the operation and, and they actually said what they had removed and it did, it did shrink. And what they had removed, they said it, they came back and they could not find cancer. That was over 10 years ago. That was over 10 years ago. Praise God. Now, praise God. Now, will sickness try to come on, come against us and hit us? Yeah, I will try. Where does it come from? Well, I'm so glad you asked. What time is it anyways? Oh, okay, I better stop, eh? A little bit longer. Can you, can you bear a little bit longer? Is this okay? Okay, Luke chapter 13, verse 10. Oh, before I, I keep needing to finish 1 Peter chapter 5. It says, be... Uh, after he said, casting all care upon him, for he cares for you, next verse in Peter, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, lion seeking whom he may devour. The devil walks around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He's not walking around seeking whom he may kill, because he's been stripped of that ability. He's looking for someone to, well, he's not stripped of that ability because he, he, he is given the power of death. Who's killing people? It's the devil. It's in the Bible. So, so the thing that we need to understand, though, is that as a believer in Jesus, if your face shield is down, you're not resist because the Bible says here, if you keep reading, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him steadfast in the faith. So how do you resist the devil? In faith. Not just because you say you believe. It's got to be faith that comes from you hearing God's word, because that's where faith comes from, is hearing and hearing the word of God. That's in Romans chapter 10, verse 17. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. And, and when you hear God's word, and, and, and how do you hear God's word? Jesus, remember Mark chapter 4, four different grounds Jesus talked about? The good ground, Jesus said, was the last ground he talked about. The good ground, or the good heart, is a person who hears the word and receives it. See, there's a lot of people that go to church, they hear the word, and there's some that don't receive it. They're like, oh, I don't know about this stuff. This is crazy. You know, and, and people have done that. I've seen people come to this church, and they're not here anymore because they just said, I don't believe that. And unfortunately, because they had that response, they don't see any fruit of God's word manifesting, the good things of God's word manifesting in their life because they made a decision. And so the good ground is people who hear the word and receive it. And act on it, yeah. And act on it. Okay, so resist him steadfast in the faith. Luke chapter 13, verses 10 to 17 says this. Luke chapter 13, verse 10 to 17. I'll try to do this really fast. Now, he was teaching in one of the synagogues. This is Jesus. He was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, which was Saturday. 
And behold, there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity 18 years. How long did she have the spirit of infirmity? 18 years. And was bent over and could in no way raise herself up. Verse 12, when Jesus, but when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said to her, Woman, you are loosed from your infirmity. And he said, and he laid his hands on her, and immediate, immediately she was made straight, and she glorified God. Now verse 14 says, but the ruler of the synagogue, or the leaders in the synagogue, be, answered it with indignation. They were mad. Because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, on the Saturday, and he said to the crowd, there are six, this is what the leader of the synagogue said, there are six days on which men ought to work, therefore come and be healed on, on them and not on the Sabbath day, because the Sabbath day you're supposed to rest. Verse 15, and the Lord then answered him and said, hypocrite. That's pretty offensive, Jesus. <laughs> hypocrite does not each of uh, each one of you on the sabbath loose loose his ox or his donkey from the stall and lead it away to water it so ought not this woman being a daughter listen now ought not this woman being a daughter of abraham whom satan has bound whom satan has bound think of it for 18 years, Satan has bound this woman for 18 years with this sickness, this infirmity. Be loose, Jesus said. Ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound, think of it, for 18 years, he be loose from this bond on the Sabbath. And when he said these things, all his adversaries were put to shame and all the multitudes rejoice for all the glorious things that were done by him. Now, Acts chapter 10, verse 38 says this, How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. The word power there is a Greek word dunamis, which means miracle working power. So God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. That shows you right there that God is against the works of the devil. God is against the works of the devil. And this is why we see in 1 John chapter 3, verse 8, it says, uh, uh, He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, or for this reason... The Son of God was manifested, or Jesus, the Son of God, was manifested that he destroy the works of the devil. The reason Jesus came was to destroy the works of the devil. So the title of this message tonight is, is the hin, uh, hinderer, hinderer to healing. Who's the hinderer to healing? The one who brings sickness on people. Same person. Who wants to keep you sick? It's the devil. Who wants, to keep any per who wants to keep people bound? The devil. Who wants to keep people in sin? The devil. Who wants to keep people uh, miser miserable? The devil. The devil. He's caught to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus has come to bring life in that more abundantly. My, my, uh, my sister... Uh, who gave her life to Jesus at the same time I did, she had a, a son who was born with cancer. And he died to cancer, and it was very hard. And um, at the age of, I think at the age of three, he, he died to cancer. And um, my sister was really broken over that. And she kind of was blaming God for it. And, uh, and she was fighting me. She'd come and, she, and, and I didn't want to say much to her because I didn't want to, you know, it's my sister. I didn't, I didn't want, she was going through a hard time. And she was pushing, pressuring me and pressuring me. She says, what do you say about this? And I'm like, I don't want to say anything about this. <laughs> I don't want to say anything. I mean, it's hard. 
And the first thing I said to my sister is that I quoted that scripture. The thief is the one who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus has come to bring life and that more abundantly. I said, the good news is your son is in heaven with Jesus. That's the good news. And I said, and if you hang in there, sis, with Jesus, you're going to see your son one day. And I said, just, and, and she looked, she kind of, you could see the fight was in her, but then all of a sudden she kind of, kind of just backed off. And, and she said, you know, bro, you're right. You're right. I said, don't condemn yourself, sis. And, and who, is it that, who is it that wants to destroy our lives? It's the devil. But thank God Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. And that's what I'm here to do, sis, is to encourage you moving forward. I know it's hard. It affected me too. It's hard on me. It's hard on all of us in the family. But I want you to know something, sis, that you can stand up and move forward and continue to put your faith in Jesus because he's come to bring life and that more abundantly. Anybody get anything out of this tonight? I got a lot more scriptures here. Didn't get to all of them. But I got to the main ones. There is real demons and devils. There's real angels. I'll tell you some angel stories. When I was a little boy, and I was born and raised in Windsor, Ontario. There's Point Pelee. I don't know if you know what Point Pelee. It's the, the most southern point of Canada. Mainland, Point Pelee. Then there's Pelee Island, which is the most southern land mass of Canada. It's an island. But here we are on the beach in Point Pelee. And, the way, and there's, there's undertows at this point. And they have signs. And they say, don't go out past this point because you'll get dragged under and drowned. And so they have these signs. So we, but the beach, you think they wouldn't put the beach close to it, right? But it was there. Uh, but <laughs> but we're, so we were further down, and I was just a little kid. And, um, and I happened to wander into the water, and a wave came and knocked me over and, and dragged me into the water. And uh, my parents didn't see that. That for a moment, they, I guess they turned around and looked away or whatever, and they didn't see me being dragged in the water by the water. And then this person come running over, grab me out of the water, and saved my life. Brought me under the beach. And, um, and then my parents, of course, noticed this. And they come running over. My mom's screaming. Ah! And, and, and <laughs> well, my mother was interesting. But anyways, uh, she come running over with my dad and, and uh, checked to make sure I was okay. And when they turned around to thank the person who did that, he was nowhere to be found on the beach. Just gone. Just gone. We believe it's an angel. An actual angel. The Bible says, entertain strangers, for you never know. You might be actually entertaining an angel. It's in the Bible. Anyways, then there was another time we were driving from Atacokan, or Thunder Bay to Atacokan in uh, winter time, And... Uh, I hit black ice, and the car started spinning around, and we went right into the ditch, and I had all-season tires. Went right into the ditch with my Mazda Protégé, 1994 Mazda Protégé, no, 96, 96 Mazda Protégé. We're in the ditch, and I'm going, we're driving, I'm driving to go preach in Atacokan, because I was driving back and forth from Atacokan, or Thunder Bay, Atacokan that time. And I said, Devil! You can't stop me from preaching the Bible. I'm going to preach this morning. That's where I'm going. I'm going to Atacoke. I'm going to preach the word of God. And you can't stop me. Angels, push the car out. I put it in reverse. And it was as if I was on dry pavement. Drove the car out of an icy, all-season tires. In the ditch. I drove back out of the dry, backed out of the ditch. Back onto the road.
No? All right, right on. Praise God. So, yeah, angels are real. In Atacokan, uh, I, I did a youth group for a number of years there. And all of a sudden, one night, my eyes were open to see angels coming down and coming towards the church. And I kept saying to the, I kept saying to the youth, I said, do you see the angels? And they're like, oh, I don't see the angels. And I said, and, I, and the building was about as high as this, the windows. And I said, and I could see the heads going by the window. And I said, you guys see that? And the youth are like, oh, I don't see that. And, uh, and so anyways, after youth group was done, uh, Adam and Josh went out uh, walking around outside the, outside the church. And then Adam, he actually started, he said, he, he started seeing the angels and actually freaked them out. He got so scared, he started running away. All right? And, uh, and so that, it's real. All that stuff is real. Okay. Yeah, and, and so all I'm saying is that this, what the Bible says is, is real. It's true. It's real. But the poor, I, and we're not here to glorify demons or we're not here to glorify angels. We're here to glorify Jesus. All right. All right. Anybody got something you want us to pray about?
Okay. So she's going to be moved up here. Okay. Okay. Somewhere else. So, so what are we praying about? Because the Bible says whatever we desire when we pray, believe that you receive it and you'll have it. Yeah, good stuff. So let's pray for direction and guidance is what I'm hearing. And you believe that's what's going to happen? Say that again. The help to move her. Okay. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you right now in the mighty name of Jesus. And Lord, we agree with Marguerite that Lord, uh, that for direction and guidance with her mom in the where she should be, that, Lord, she'll be looked after, be taken care of. And, Lord, we also thank you for the help that will be there to help her to be moved. And we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Anyone else with a prayer request? Yeah. Okay. So what do you believe? We're, what are you believing is going to happen when we pray for her? Every bit made whole. Let's, let's, and we're going to agree with that. You believe that's what's going to happen? Amen. Father, and what's her name? Linda. We thank right now. We thank you, Lord God, that Linda, every bit made whole. In Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> Anyone else? Yeah. Do you believe that's what's going to happen? So, Father, we agree with Denise right now that strength in her dad's legs and that he'll be balanced and not fall. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, Mindy? You and your husband seem to have this issue. <laughs> No, I know, but I mean, you seem to be following him. Because uh, <laughs> he fell and hurt his toe. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what do you believe, though, Mindy? So you're no pain in your toe? Okay. Okay, come here. Stand right here. You've been healed lots, Mindy. <laughs> Many times. I'm just going to ask the Holy Spirit how he wants to do this. Oh, there it goes. There it goes. Pain gone. The cause of the pain gone. The bruising, the swelling. Gone in Jesus' name. 
Mindy, just shake my hand. We're going to agree. In Jesus' name. Yeah, there we go. There we go. Now do something you couldn't do before. So it was, there it goes. <laughs> there it is. It's, so you had pain before you came up. And then you don't have pain right now? Listen, we're not making this up. So you can say, oh, look at that. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. It's gone. The numbness is gone. Oh, praise God. <laughs> I was preaching in Fort Hope. Yeah, it was Fort Hope. And... Um, and there was a young fellow that came up. I, I, I was sitting there at the end of the service. I would say, anybody wants to get saved, come forward. And, uh, and a lot of people came forward and invited Jesus into their life. And there was this young fellow that didn't want to come forward. And, um, and he, was, he was looking at me. And, and, and then after, after we prayed for all the people and th there were sick people that got healed and everything else, he, he finally, the young fellow came up. And I was finally. Then I sat down, and the 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 worship team, the singers, they they started singing, they and they were just going. And so I just sat down, and this young fellow came, sat beside me, and he said, "I wanted to put my hand up, but God wouldn't accept a person like me." And I started telling him, "I said, you're wrong, because the Bible says, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son." That whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. And I looked at him and I said, are you in the world? He said, yeah, I guess I am. Well, that means that you qualify. I was in the world. I all of us are in the world and we all qualify for that statement. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And he said, yeah, but no, God wouldn't accept someone like me. And I looked at him and I said, you're a homosexual. He put his head down and he says, yeah. I said, you know what? For God so loved the world. He loved, you know what? There's heterosexual sinners. There's homosexual sinners. There's all kinds of sexual sinners. But God so loved the world, which included every sin under the sun. He loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. A few moments later, that young man gave his life to Jesus. And he's like, wow, I feel light. I feel good on the inside. Wow. And then he's like, gives me a big hug. He says, thank you. And he gets up and he's limping. And I looked at him and said, you want to fix that too? You want Jesus to fix that? Oh, he wouldn't, uh, he wouldn't want to fix something. I, oh, we're going to go through this again, I said. I said, we're going to go through this again. I said, just as much as he wanted to save you, he wanted to heal you. And he did it both when he died on the cross and rose again. I said, so would you like to get rid of that? And he says, you bet. Anyways, prayed for him. And he got healed. And he got up and he stopped limping. And then I said, and he's like, oh. And he was more excited than you were, Minnie. I'm sorry. But he was really excited. And he's just like, oh, oh. And he's like doing this and he's like doing this. And, he's, and I said, why don't you just go run around the building? And he started running around the building. And everybody just started laughing and clapping. And a lot of people got excited that day, night. Because they saw this young man who they knew who he was. I didn't know who he was. But they knew who he was. 
But they also saw and knew what he had gone through and knew what happened for him to be limping. And God healed him. I was in Ottawa, Piscat, another reserve. And uh, I told you guys this story. It just, I remember it like it happened yesterday. I'm sitting there preaching like I am tonight. And there's people in the building. And this guy walks in from the community at night, like tonight, black, sunglasses on, walks right up, sits in a chair right behind me. And I'm like, yeah, I'm like, I'm like okay, what, whatever. <laughs> and I just keep preaching, right? And, and, uh, and then I said, after the end, I said, anybody would like to give their life to Jesus? Come on up. Or in his case, he came down because he was up on the stage. And he comes walking down, and he stands right in front of me. He says, and I said, you want to give your life to Jesus? He says, yeah, I, I, I want to give my life to Jesus. And, and as, he's, as I'm praying with him and leading him in a prayer of salvation, all of a sudden his leg is burning. And he's like, oh, oh. And he's like, and I'm like, look at him. I said, what's going on? He said, my leg is burning. I said, there's something wrong. was there something wrong with your leg? He said, yeah, I had an operation, and, and I've had problems with his knee. And, and he was just like telling me about all the problems. I said, oh, that's just Jesus healing you right now. He said, let's get back to your salvation. <laughs> Anyways, he got saved. He got healed at the same time. I'm tired. It's exciting. Uh, Norway house. I was in Norway house, and an elderly lady, 80 in her 80s, and she was wheeled into the, into the, into the church uh, service I was holding in, in uh, Norway House. And uh, she was in a wheelchair. She had, uh, wasn't able to walk for about two years and uh, in a wheelchair. And, uh, and I looked at her and I said, do you believe that Jesus heals today? And she's like, yeah. I mean, I was preaching healing that night. And, uh, and anyways, uh, I said, you believe? And she's, yeah. I said, get up and walk in Jesus' name. And she got up out of that wheelchair and started walking. She actually left that building uh, without the wheelchair. Walked out without the, without the wheelchair. And she was, been, and everybody, everybody, and listen, for me, I'm, I'm just a guy, that, a stranger that came to share good news. That's all I was. I came to share good news. And, and she, they got a hold of it. And they were so excited. I mean, they were just clapping, hooting, and hollering. I mean, it was, you know, in Ottawa, Piscat, they got so excited that people got on the floor and they started rolling. And the, and the singer, you know, rolling for Jesus, rolling for Jesus. And he started singing this song. And then they were all rolling like on the floor. And I'm like, okay, this is something new. But, hey, whatever rocks your boat, let's go. And <laughs> church is not supposed to be stuffy and dead. Church is supposed to be alive. Because our Savior, Jesus, is alive. All right. With every eye closed tonight, nobody looking around, we have people watching online right now, and this goes out to a lot of people. Um, I know people from New York City have watched this. People in Europe have watched this uh, service. We have people that uh, in this community that are watching this. And if you're here, if you're, and just every eye closed, nobody looking around. If you're online right now, or even in this room, and you don't know that Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You don't know Jesus, this, the one who came to bring life, and that more abundantly. That he said, Jesus himself said, you must be born again. And the Bible, and, and the, the guy he was talking to, Nicodemus, he said, how can I be born uh, again? How can I go back into my mother's womb and be birthed again? It's impossible. And Jesus said, that which is born of water, uh, of the flesh is flesh and that which is born of the spirit of spirit and he was referring to the spirit being born again in John chapter 1 how do you get born again the Bible says believe in Jesus and receive Jesus you have to receive Jesus into your life to be born again you have to receive listen since I've been born again it's been awesome yeah, I've had challenges, but Jesus has helped me through them all and still will help me as I put faith in him. And so Jesus, receiving Jesus into your heart, saying, Jesus, come into my heart, I receive you.
The Bible says as many as all who do that, God the Father births you anew. Your spirit changes. You become, as the Bible says, a new creature in Christ Jesus. The old disappears. The new has come. That's a change that happens on the inside. Not on, you're, you still look the same on the outside. You'll still have the same thoughts. Well, hopefully change thoughts now after tonight. But the Bible says as many as received him, he gave them the power to become his children. Born into his family. Then it says in Romans chapter 10, it says if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, you will be saved. And it goes on and says, for with the mouth or with the heart you believe to righteousness and with the mouth confession is made to salvation. And so if you're watching this tonight online, if you're here tonight, and you don't know, you don't know if you received, you don't know if you have this relationship. It's about relationship with Jesus. It's about being united with God. If you don't know this Jesus, you're missing out on the best thing in life. I'm telling you right now, he is the life giver. And if you're here or if you're watching online and you're like, I don't know. If you don't know, like, I'm going to ask you this question. If you died tonight, do you believe, do you know if you're going to heaven? And if you're not sure, why not make it sure? How can I make it sure? By receiving Jesus into your life. So if you're here or if you're watching online, I just want to put this out to you right now. And ask you to repeat this prayer. If you want to receive Jesus, you want this newness of life. I want you to repeat this prayer after me. I'm just helping you here tonight. You're not praying to me. You're not praying to join a religion. You're you're doing this to be in a relationship with the one who loves you. So say this after me. Dear Heavenly Father. Everybody just say it out loud. Dear Heavenly Father. Thank you for loving me so much that you sent Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You died on the cross for my sins. You rose again on the third day. I believe this. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus, I receive you into my heart. Come into my life. I welcome you tonight. In Jesus' name, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. I believe that God raised Jesus from the dead. And I thank you for that tonight. Jesus is Lord. And I I, I don't follow the works of darkness anymore. I'm done with that. I'm done with that. I don't belong to the devil. I'm free from sin. I've been delivered. I'm free. Because Jesus has now set me free. In Jesus' name, amen. I believe if you prayed that prayer, you're born again. I really do. It's exciting. I've seen a lot of people. I mean, every one of us have done it. Well, let's close in prayer tonight. Father, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for all your goodness. We thank you that you're our awesome God, a good God, a loving God. And I thank you that you never fail, you never change. And I thank you that you're always good. Lord, tonight, I thank you for everyone here. I thank you for those that are watching online. I thank you for healing tonight. I thank you for salvations tonight. I thank you, Lord, that you're a good, good God. And Lord, we thank you so much that you're an awesome God, that you are always with us. You said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I thank you that you're with us. And we give you all the praise, the glory, and the honor tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. And for those that have asked Jesus in your life, um, if you want, uh, we'll give you a booklet. Just email us at ffpa180 at gmail.com. That's the church's address. And we're going to send, give us your address and we'll send you a welcome to the family book. And if you don't have a Bible, let us know and we'll get you a Bible. 
and, uh, and we're ready to hear from you. If you're here tonight and you want to get this material, just let us know. Guy's actually the one who has it in the back. Uh, you got them there, eh, Guy? Somewhere. <laughs> we got them here. So if you're wanting those information, we can give it to you. That's not a problem. Anyways, thanks for coming here. Have a good night.